All right. So we've been talking about rebuking with love and gossiping. I'm going to move through a lot of this, these other points kind of quickly. Um, so let's talk about conflict resolution. Um, things that seem small to you are big to others and vice versa. Okay. It's important to note that, oh, well, that's not that big of a deal. Well, well to them, it is. See, it doesn't matter so much what you meant. It's what was understood by the other person. I meant to do good, yeah, but it was received in a negative way. And how someone understands something to be is oftentimes more important than how you actually meant it. Like I mentioned in Matthew 5, 9 about be a peacemaker. Be the one causing the peace. And verse 23 through 24 says, Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there, remember that your bro brother or sister has something against you. Leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. If someone has something wrong against you, this is what we do. You know what? I don't have a problem with them, and I tried to make peace with them, but you know, they're just going to have to get over it. No, that's not what we should be saying. We should be going and making peace, even though, even if you think you didn't have anything to do with it. Things that seem small to you are big to others and vice versa. Oftentimes, simply by talking things out, they resolve. Uh, Matthew 18 Um, 7 through 8. Woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. Um, if you're... How far did I want to go on this? Ah, I'm in the wrong verse. Um, Matthew 18, 23. Ah, that would explain things. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The king decides to let it go, and the person goes out, this slave goes out, and demands money back from another slave of a much less value of a much smaller value um and the king hears about it and throws him in jail what am i getting at if you don't forgive other people god will not forgive you it's that simple you have to forgive other people the same as god forgave you acts um 24 16 and watch out about that if you, if you are the person who's who's thinking of being contentious about what I just said, oh well, well that's not necessarily true. Ask yourself why you don't want it to be true. Because maybe you have a bad attitude towards someone that you don't want to forgive. So I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. That's um, in Acts twenty four sixteen, Romans twelve, Romans twelve, not Romans. Romans is not actually a book in the Bible. Romans 12, 9-14 says, Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your uh, spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Really, a lot of stuff there, just showing how the love applies. Um, Hebrews 12, 14. I believe this is the passage that I just mentioned. As you can tell, it's not in Hebrews 13, it's in Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, um, 14 says, Make every effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. First Peter three seventeen. For it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Um, okay. Only go to the person you are in conflict with. Um, I already kind of elaborated on that. You always must forgive, even if you were wronged. But I was wronged. You still have to forgive. Uh, don't harbor it in your memory. 
If someone molested your child, you should not forget in the sense that you would trust them alone again, but you should still forget in the sense of you don't bear witness of that wrong. Does that make sense? I hope it does. Um, you must forgive them. However, you would still have to forgive that person. You would still have to... Um, well, there's no other way to say it. To forgive that person. Sin does not justify sin. One way that our youth pastor said about... Um, how you know that you that you have forgiven someone if you see them in Walmart and it's not awkward. <laughs> I love that. Um, sin does not justify sin. Basically, if they did something stupid, that doesn't give you right to do something stupid. Does that make sense? Oftentimes we justify ourselves. Oh, well, they did this, or they did it first, or they did do do. It doesn't matter what that person did. You're not responsible for them. You're responsible for you. If you reacted poorly, you are also at fault. What? Yes. Yes. If someone sinned against you, and you reacted poorly. Now, I'm not saying, for instance, in the case of the child who is molested, that you should not protect your child, that you should not stand up for your child. I'm not saying that at all. But you don't have to love punishment. You don't have to love judgment. List both what you think, um, what you think you did wrong and what they think you did wrong. What we do, we're in conflict with someone and, oh, well, I only did this and it really wasn't that bad. But what do they think that you did wrong? See, once you separate what you think and what they think, it oftentimes clarifies itself. Um, apologize for the underlying attitude which caused the action and ask for forgiveness. This is how we how we usually ask for, ask for, uh, ask for forgiveness or apologize. Um, I'm sorry if what I did was wrong. I'm sorry if I offended you. I was wrong, but it was because that's not an apology. Um, or we, we just apologize for the service. I'm sorry I lied. Apologize for the underlying attitude which caused the action and then ask for forgiveness. Allow your pride to die. The pride that gets you into conflict keeps you there. Okay. This is how you would correctly apologize. The Lord has convicted me, or if you want to take a less pious route, that's fine. It doesn't matter how you word it, just that you're sincere. I realize... Actually, let me take that back. You don't want to say have too many I's in your apology. The other person's already upset with I. You need to have more U's. The other day, I said this and this. I am sorry for my pride. I'm sorry that I can't that I that what I said was very uh, vengeful and very um, very bitter. Um, please forgive me. Or, in fact, it's actually better to say it like this: Will you forgive me? Because what we try to do is we just try to throw out a, an apology and then um, just move on. But what you actually have to do is throw out the apology and then um, um, ask for an apology. It makes you take ownership of it. Uh, don't expect them to be reasonable, but be reasonable yourself. Okay? Don't expect them to be reasonable, but you be reasonable. So. Okay, if someone must be wronged, let it be you. I already talked about this. If someone must be humiliated, let it be you. Doing things out of love removes any excuse for personal offense. Just think about that. So how to have a clear conscience? Don't ignore those who irritate. See, what we try to do to have a clear conscience is we just try to abstain from having any relationship with those people who annoy us. Well, that's not good, and that actually prevents us from further ministry. If you learn to deal with those annoying people, you will be able to witness to more people. If you don't, God will keep bringing those kinds of people by so that you learn to deal with them and so you're, you can then go out and minister and do ministry with them or for them. Um, Proverbs 6, 20-23 My son, keep your father's command and do not forsake your mother's teaching. Bind them always on your heart, fasten them around your neck. When you walk, they will guide you. When you sleep, they will watch over you. When you awake, they will speak to you. Um, once again, about the um, the advice and the counsel of your parent. Proverbs 10, 12. And you know, life is too short to harbor resentment against your, against your parents. Even if they were the best, worst parents in the world, 
Let it go. I mean, you've got so little, little to live. So little to live. There's just not much life. I and mean, people only live the tops of like, what, 70 to 90 somewhere? Uh, hatred stirs up conflict, but love covers over all wrongs. Hatred stirs up conflict. I and mean, oftentimes what will happen is something will happen in our past which will um, make us withdraw from the world. Like, I don't know, sexual mol molestation, um, abuse, those kinds of things. And it will cause us to withdraw from the world. And this is not good. Um, what will happen is a root, as an attitude will take root. And if you don't deal with it, that turns into other attitudes. Um, I know one. I knew one person, knew uh, one person who um, was molested as a child, and so they um, their entire life caused conflict with everyone. See how those things affect us. They affect the way we deal with stuff. Proverbs fifteen twenty eight says, um, "The heart of the righteous weighs its answers, but the mouth of the wicked gushes evil. Just gushes evil." Okay. So, first off, to have a clear conscience, you have to make sure that you're resolving things. List those offended. Who have you offended? Okay. Then analyze yourself and others' attitude towards you. Don't analyze everybody else. Analyze yourself and analyze those people's attitudes towards you. List offenses that it, for, for each person from the greatest to the smallest. What we like to do is we like to start from the smallest and just kind of work our way up. This is better for our pride, but worse for the situation. The person will get more and more irritated when you don't address the thing that has actually caused the conflict. You married people. You and your wife will be squabbling about a bunch of little things, and it turns out that two or so months ago, you did this one stupid thing that you just wrote off as not a big deal, that your wife took great offense at, and she's been harboring resentment ever since. See what I mean? Those kinds of things. And by not listening to your spouse, not communicating with your spouse, the situation got worse. List your offenses from greatest to smallest. If you don't know your offenses, go and ask them what you did wrong. This is probably what will happen. They will shoot out just a bunch of things that, that, that just as quickly as they can think about them without actually talking about the, the root thing. But with that being said, if you can't remember the root thing and they're not willing to say the root thing, then treat those things as though they are important, as though they are the root thing. Does that make sense? So say, look, I am sorry that I did those things. I, I, I did them out of pride. I did them out of arrogance. Whatever the root attitude was, um, like let's say you lied. I did it out out of fear, and um, and uh, a little bit of envy too. I, 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 I'm really sorry for that. Will you forgive me? List defenses from greatest to smallest. Discover your root attitude, then decide the wording. Okay, we need to actually think about our wording before we go out and do it. Um, God has convicted me of how wrong I've been in my whatever the basic offense or the root attitude was. Will you forgive me? That's how you word an apology. Um, decide time. Are they busy? Oftentimes we try to inconvenience people with our apology. Are they alone? Oftentimes we don't we don't we make things that are personal issues public issues. Proof and proof and uh, point in fact. Go on Facebook anytime soon. I mean it's just terrible the things that people post on social media. Um, how is their attitude? Are they still upset? Have you given them adequate time and space? Sometimes we try to go and resolve something when the person's not ready to receive it yet. Well, that's not my problem. Yes, it is your problem. You caused the issue, or at least you were a factor in it somewhere. You need to make sure that you do it with uh, that you make um, make uh, make things right in the right way. Sometimes people need space to calm down, and relax. Don't take scripture out of context. Sometimes what we do is, oh no, the Bible says to go and, and to go right now and, and to uh, and to fix it. Yes, but once again, the Bible also condones being tactful. G uh, Jesus praised the unrighteous steward because of how shrewd he was, how 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 foresighted he was, how how wise he was in the book of La uh, Luke. With that being said, handle things with wisdom. Um, don't jerk the passages out of, out of context and just prove the con the conviction that you already have. Actually analyze the scriptures. Decide the method. Personal visit or calls only. Only phone call someone if they are not somewhere where you can go and, and, and talk to them in person. No texting. No emails. No letters. The, you can't see it there, but it's but behind my little box there there's right here it says no um no letters 
No texting, no letters, no emails. Do it in person or if you absolutely have to over the phone, but do not text. Oh my goodness, never do this. It'll just make the person matter. When you do this, um, don't go into sensual detail. Don't go into detail. Start with the greatest offense. Don't go to others or apologize in front of others. It needs to be sincere and it needs to be private. Nobody needs to be involved except for those who are involved. Okay? Their response is not your concern. Now let me kind of clarify that. Apologize because you were wrong. You don't apologize so that you will feel better or that they can accept you back. You apologize because you were wrong and an apology is the right thing to do. That's why you apologize. So what happens if you apologize and they don't accept it? You apologize that they're, that they're not ready to accept it. Maybe you did it at the wrong time, maybe whatever. Maybe they just need space and to see that you actually do mean it. And so say, uh, well, I'm sorry, and um, move on. Oh, well, I already apologized. Or uh, remember, if somebody has to lose, let it be you. Um, let, remember, you're trying to show the sincerity here. So if you're not sincere, maybe you shouldn't even apologize. Goodness sakes. Or maybe you should go to prayer until you are sincere. Uh, because if somebody, if you offend a brother, you should, that should concern you. That should concern you. But one thing that, I, that I've heard is, well, um, why would I say sorry when I'm not sorry? I'm not a sorry person. What, what does that mean? We're not talking about your quality of a person. We're talking about whether you regret what you did. Goodness sakes. Uh, people and their pride. Oh, I say I apologize instead of I'm sorry because I'm not I'm not a sorry person. Goodness sakes, curb honestly. Think about the things that go through your head before you say them, and curb the stupid thoughts and allow the positive thoughts. Just a general principle. Um, it's your responsibility um, to go to someone. Um, and the reason why I'm saying things so bluntly in this lesson is first off because I don't know you, ha 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 ha, and second off because I don't, you don't know me, so I don't have the chance to say things in, in a way that, that I can then later clarify. I don't have that chance. Um, the things I have to say, I have to say quickly, and in a very blunt way. I would not recommend you going and telling other people that you do know the same thing that I'm saying right now in the same way that I'm saying it. Okay. Um, People have a really easy time of misunderstanding you. You understand this even more when you teach. You have to clarify yourself, then you have to re-clarify yourself. You have to preach on something about 20 times before somebody actually understands the full extent of what you're saying. And then, when they're actually able to apply it to their lives. Okay? I was so surprised the first time that I taught on a really deep subject, thought I was super accomplished. And then the very next week, somebody did exactly what I what I it's shown them and given them examples of and shown, shown them the application and so many different things and they still didn't get it. See what I mean? You have to teach something about 20 times. So I don't get that opportunity with you. You're watching a video. So I'm saying things in a very blunt way. I would not recommend saying these things in this blunt of a way in person um, or with people that you know. Um, so um, it's your responsibility to go to someone who's uh, upset with you even if you didn't do anything wrong or even if you don't think you did anything wrong. Remember, it doesn't matter so much. What you actually did is what they think that you did. Never say, they just have to get over it. Never say that. Um, a genuine apology... Where am I on this? A genuine apology is marked by the desire to heal the other person. If you get offended when someone rejects your apology, you probably weren't sorry in the first place. Most apologies are rejected because of the way they were said or what was said. Some are rejected because of past his, um, I'm betting that's history. Past history. Show that you are sorry for after you apologize. Don't just simply apologize and let it go. Apologize and then show that you are sorry. Don't delay an apology, but wait to witness. Okay? They're not going to listen to you right after apology. What we try to do is we try to throw in an apology and then we try to witness to the person. Big mistake. Um, you're just going to turn them off of Christ. You will usually know when you are doing something wrong. I will say that. Well, what if I just don't even know that I'm doing something wrong? Usually you'll know something you're doing something wrong. Or the Holy Spirit will convict you after the fact. Conviction will come. Bite the bullet and make it right. You know, the same 
pride that gets us into a problem is the same pride that keeps us in that problem, that keeps us from, from, from going and making things right. So bite the bullet and go and make it right. As soon as you think about doing it, just go and do it. The longer you, do, you postpone, the worse, it'll, the worse it'll get and the harder it'll get. What we do is we don't tell God no, we just tell him later. So don't tell him later, do it now. Uh, don't avoid it. Even if it seems like the person is not offended, but you know what you did was wrong. Come on. There we go. When you know what you did was wrong, apologize. It will change how they see you. Look, I did this, and I don't think that that's right. I don't think that I should have said or done that. Man, I did that because of this. Please forgive me. And when I say I did that because of this, I did that because I was being prideful. Or I did that because I was uh, being, um, you know, short-tempered or whatever. Apologize for the masked attitudes. I have been struggling with an attitude problem uh, towards you. That would be a good example of what you wouldn't want to say. Okay. You you don't want to go up to somebody and say, I have a... Um, I hate you, and I'm sorry. You don't want to say something like that. But you do want to apologize for the masked attitudes. Why do you hate them? Well... I've been harboring resentment for you in my heart, and um, I've never really been able to let that go. And I wanted to say that I'm sorry, and that um, I really am trying to change, and I really am trying to let go of, of bitterness. Will you please forgive me? Never ever under any circumstance apologize for sins, especially to the opposite sex, that have to do with sinful habits. Let me explain. You have been having lustful thoughts for this woman. That woman is married. Even if she's not married. I mean, for the sake of this, it doesn't even matter if she's not married. Um, and you go to her and say, I've been having problems, you know, masturbating uh, over you. No. No, under any circumstance, no. Okay? Um, well, you also wouldn't want to have a confidant that it's a woman when you struggle with things like porn. I looked at porn again this week. So what are you setting up for that, for that woman? You are setting up the idea that you have a problem with sexual immorality. What if she also has a problem with sexual immorality? Problem. Not only that, but when people spend time with each other, they oftentimes lower their guard. Not a good thing. Just have discretion and just don't even go here, okay? Same sex, okay? Same sex. Don't say an apology that is going to cause a conflict. Apologies are to resolve conflict. I really don't like you, and I'm sorry. That's like I said. Expect from your kids what you expect from you. Uh, expect from your excuse me. Expect from your kids what you expect from you. I'm continually surprised at the amount of people who do things like okay, a telemarketer calls and you tell the kid to lie. I uh, tell them I'm not here, but you are here. You tell them to lie, and then when their kid lies, they're like, oh, well, how, why'd you learn this? They they have a bitter attitude towards someone, and then their kids have a bitter attitude towards them, and they're just like, where did this come from? They always talk bad about authority, the president, the police. The this, the that, and then their kids have a problem with their authority, and they're just like, see you know what I mean? Don't expect your kids to do any different than what you do. If they do, kudos to them, but don't expect it from them. So why even have, why even bother to have a clear conscience? Well, besides the fact of it being, you know, commanded, um, boldness to witness. When we have a clear conscience, we have our mind, our mind is free, and we're able to, to really. Uh, pursue ministry. Freedom to resolve conflicts. I think this one kind of speaks for itself. Alertness for wise decisions. We won't be weighted down by these things. Power to overcome temptation. God will withhold grace for the prideful person. If you are not um, clearing your conscience, that is pride. Excuse me. Um, oh no, this person really hurt me. So you have pride in your hurt, but you still have pride. We'll talk more about pride in the last lesson. Um, power to overcome temptation. I already said that. And the ability to build genuine friendships. Because you're able to now look past things. You're able to look past your mistakes. You're able to look past others' mistakes. Oftentimes, we can't even forgive ourselves. And then we can't forgive others because we can't forgive ourselves. And there's just, just these rude attitudes that we need to repent and, and of and, and, and correct in order to move forward. But yet we try to, we try to get rid of the results of our conflict without without resulting re resolving 
the cause of our conflict. Emotions are temporary. Your conscience is not your guide. There's a song that came out um, a couple months ago. I guess it was last year and by now. And it said, follow your arrow. Well, that's good, except Jeremiah says that the heart is wicked above all else. Okay? It is wicked. All right? You don't want to be following your your, your heart. Um, the, the song of Pinocchio, it's a good meaning, but it's a little bit naive because nowadays people's conscience are, is so seared that you can't necessarily say that. And why are people's conscience seared today? Because the parents of last generation didn't didn't weren't there for them because they have gotten into things like pornography and drugs. Pornography is rampant. If you pastor a church, guarantee that at least at least 50% of your congregation are, is looking at porn. I mean, you just have to you just have to plan for these things. Um, and so we need to be changing what we're talking about to actually talk about the things that people are struggling with. Once again, if you notice, this is a discipleship course. We haven't even talked much about doctrine so much as talking about how the doctrine applies to the life. Um, <clears throat> so, emotions are temporary. Emotions are temporary. Um, there's a lot of teenagers in schools nowadays that are confused as to their sexual orientation, and they, they even think that they're that they're gay sometimes. Emotions are not temporary, and the thing is, we don't we aren't establishing that to our kids. We're establishing that emotions are primary. Not only that, but our society is still telling them relativism, that everything is right as long as it's right in your own eyes. Um, so, um, accountability. Pick one or two wise people of the same sex to help you answer to. These are people that you report to. You can get uh, software for your computer if you have problems looking at porn. Um, get rid of the, uh, the the data plan on your cell phone. You don't have to have data plans on your cell phone. Uh, you don't even have to have a cell phone. I mean, goodness sakes, find a solution. Just stay out of sin. Jesus gave that pair, uh, gave that story about cutting on uh, uh, cutting out your own eye if it causes you to sin. Obviously, he did not literally mean to take out your own eye. But he's trying to establish that as, as, as go to whatever extent you need to to get out of sin and stay out of sin. They will regularly stay in touch as a buffer between you and a mistake. They will regularly stay in touch at, um, as a buffer between you and a mistake. Also, there will be people who you can turn to if you are in, a, in between a rock and a hard place. Oh, I just, I just can't get rid of this urge. See if one of them are able to go hang out. And if not, go to the park. I don't care. Go on a walk. Take a bike ride. Take a cold shower. Goodness sakes. Just do whatever you need to. Starting conflicts with or opposing authority brings curses and destruction. We'll get into this once again in the last lesson, but it's worth mention mentioning here. Um, you cannot possibly have a con clear conscience if you're talking bad about your authority. Um, it'll bring curses on your household and your spiritual life. It will feel like you've run out of luck, if, if you will. Um, so, um, number 16, you can read that. Romans 13, 1 through 2. I like how when you're sleeping, you get, you know, you wake up in the middle of the night and you can't go to sleep, and so then you get, and get up and do something, and then you just kind of drag. It's like, well, come on, if I can't sleep. <laughs> anyway, there's Romans 13. 1 through 2, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The, other, the authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authorities is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do this will bring judgment on themselves. Except, of course, the American Revolution, right? Um, Hebrews 13:17. You know, you know, there are a few situations that rebellion is, um, it may, not is, but may possibly be condoned. But with that being said, keep in mind that in the New Testament, Jesus warned about how living by the sword causes you to die by the sword. Okay, like, for instance, freedom is great. I'm not going to lie, I live in America, and there's a lot of places that don't have freedom. Most of the world, actually. Even in America, freedom is getting limited. Um, but... That doesn't mean that freedom is the most important aspect of life. If if Christianity becomes illegal in America, I'm still going to be a Christian. You see what I mean? Like it, it I'm, I'm sure you get what I'm saying. Um, 
Hebrews 13, 17. And, you know, even if there are some excuses for rebellion, people by nature are very rebellious. We don't need any, any help with rebelling. So it's very important that we don't seek more justification for rebelling. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as one who will... Um, as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. Um, uh, and also, it's just like a last little note here. Never mock the Holy Spirit. Um, be very careful when you're discerning the gifts of the Spirit in a, in a church. Um, whether or not it is actually the Holy Spirit or not, be very careful about outright saying that it's not, um, especially just because the person who gave it you don't like or because the way you don't like the way they said it or whatever. Um, just be very careful about the Holy Spirit. That is the only thing that Jesus ever mentioned was um, unforgivable. Um, now, some would argue about whether or not that means that you won't be saved or whether that just means in heaven there'll be a punishment for it, I I don't know. It's not really my place. But what I do know is that Jesus specifically said that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit um, is unforgivable. So it's very important. You know, don't don't joke about the Holy Spirit. Don't don't even go to that area. Um, just stay away from anything that has to do with um, treating with anything with the Holy Spirit. Just just. Stay away from that. Don't joke about it. Don't don't kid around. Don't uh, just stay away from that. Um, and we are done for this. Oh no, we are not. Um, in the next video, I'll finish up this this lesson.